Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Ina. How are you today? Hi, Michael. I am great, thank you. I'm excited to be here and to share some learnings and insights with your listeners. I'm really delighted. I have a a younger person on the podcast. <laughs> I love it when a young person comes on the podcast because I I I learn new things from young people every single day, and hopefully it's a two way street. And um, I look forward to hearing your story um, and everything you've been up to on, on your journey. Mm. So, you know, I'm gonna open it up with a really really broad question and then hand it over to you and I will listen and interject as we go along I'm sure so why don't you tell us your story and how you got to where you are today yeah of course so yeah I mean I think you'll find with most business owners it's a bit of a convoluted path um you kind of don't really set out to do it and um when you look back your experience kind of makes sense in retrospect but when you're on that path it doesn't really um or that's kind of how it was for me so I graduated a long time ago now um over six years ago uh, and I started my career in tech sales straight out of university um so yeah if there's any kind of younger people listening I know that sales is frowned upon as a career which I just think is so silly because it's such an incredible place to learn Um, and it does make me sad that a lot of really good grads go after the banking and the finance and all of those standard roles but they really dismiss a career in sales which I think if you want to be in business and you want to have your own business then you have to fundamentally be good at sales and or marketing Um, so I always knew I wanted to do my own thing and I got this offer to work in tech sales And that was just being thrown in the deep end. It was really, really tough, but I learned so, so much. Um, And I then moved on to invest in property um, because I decided I want to do my own thing. And I put my savings into property. Um, And that was like entering a whole new world that I knew nothing about. And so when I entered that world, I did a lot of networking. And in doing the networking, I met a lot of small business owners and primarily um, property business owners and I was doing my property stuff and as I was networking I realized that a lot of these entrepreneurs that I was talking to were really struggling to to get seen online and to attract more clients and customers Um, frankly speaking they were not very good at the marketing and the sales side Um, yes and and really harnessing social media which was quite a new thing for business um Mm -hmm. this was around four or five years ago or it was really taking off and I just started working for a few of these business owners um consulting them like helping them to grow online and that's really I just discovered that I was really good at it and that's really how I came here today so I worked as a consultant for a couple of years and then I productized my learnings and my experience into an online program or an online product um which yeah that and that's how I got here today so I absolutely love working with business owners on their marketing and just helping them grow and acquire more customers um but yeah that's a Uh whistle stop tour (laughs) okay that was a (laughs) really good I have some questions definitely yes I'm sure you do (laughs) Hmm. right you mentioned graduation but you kind of jumped straight to graduation but you're not originally from this country are you that's a good point I did (laughs) (laughs) yeah I don't know why I did that I think I just did the career part but yeah you're right so I yeah yeah no I moved to the UK when I was six so I was born in Bulgaria Um, right yeah and I spent I spent a year without my parents moved here um and left me for a year while they set up in the UK yeah um and so you were like five then yeah and I very vaguely remember it because it was such a traumatic experience because I remember my mum couldn't tell me that they were going to leave they weren't going to see me for a year which is understandable um so they just told me they were going to the shops but my mum was in tears (gasps) um 
yeah so that's like stuck with me um basically oh, that's, yeah sorry? that's a that's really tough at five years old to be told yeah we're just off to the shops and then didn't uh, didn't come back yeah but I totally understand it and I'm so glad and respectful that they did that like right I know that I wouldn't be in the position that I am today if they didn't take that risk and um you know luckily I was with my grandma and I spoke to my parents on the phone every single day I remember that oh so. okay great yeah that's great <laughs> <laughs> And then did you speak English in Bulgaria? No, not at all. So again, like one of my earliest memories coming to the UK was I just got put into primary school and I remember my mum sitting there in lessons. I think she was there for about two weeks, just, you know, with me every day, helping, like helping me to understand. Yeah. And then, you know, suddenly I just, I don't remember learning English. I just suddenly knew it. So... (laughs) It's, yeah. you know, at that well, age, you're, you're just a sponge. That's right. Yeah. You just pick it up. You mimic, I guess, people. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> presumably you still speak Bulgarian, if that's what it's called. Yeah, that is what it's called. Yeah. <laughs> and I do. It's it's very rusty. And probably I do have the vocab of a five-year-old <laughs> because that's when I left. But, um, yes. you know, I pick up some swear words when I go there every year. So that, of course. Yeah, <laughs> that helps. <laughs> okay. Because you've got no accent, so you must have copied and mimicked your fellow students quite closely in order to get a real English accent. Yeah, I guess. It's just, as I say, I have no recollection of learning the language. It was no. just very quick because you just you just pick it up as a, as a kid and you yeah. don't have that embarrassment of you know, having the accent originally and not knowing a word, whereas, you know, learning languages as an adult, you have all of that fear in you. Yeah. Yeah. Very true, because I came to England originally. I'm I'm Dutch. I'm from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And I came over when I was 17. And my parents wanted me to continue studying in this country. And Mm -hmm. although my upbringing, see, my mother was Anglo-Indian, my father was Dutch, so there was English spoken in the house all the time. So our mm-hmm. English was really good. TV in the Netherlands are, say, let's say it's an English or American program, and they're all subtitled with Dutch. Therefore, you're hearing English every single day on the TV, my parents talking to each other in English. So my English was very good, but I had no confidence to continue stu- to, to study in it, you know. But of course... I got a job and then the English language came really quick. So, yeah, I understand what you mean with if you're a little bit older, then it, you have this fear uh, around, you know, not being able to pick it up or not having the confidence mm. uh, to speak and, uh, it. Yeah. And do you speak any Indian? Was that ever passed down in your family? No, or? it wasn't. So my mother spoke a tiny bit of Hindi. And um, she said some words, I can't remember them. She knew how to speak it, but because she lived out of India for so long, she got very rusty and that left her as well. Mm. You know, so she had to learn Dutch uh, and her Dutch was very good. In fact, she worked for a marketing company uh, to translate magazines from English to Dutch. Wow. yeah, but anyway, it's not about me and my history. It's about yours. Okay, so you got hold of the language. You you went to school. You then went graduated, and you went into tech sales. So let's get to tech sales. Um, I I accept what you say about people want to go into the industries where they get the big bucks. Let's put it that way. You know, they chase the money. And they're mm-hmm. told, you've got to chase the money. We'll live in a capitalist world. That's what we've got to do. What, what, what was it specifically that interested you to go into sales? Mm. I mean, so I've always been obsessed with like entrepreneurship. Just, it's just Where's that come from? I don't know. It's just a weird thing. Like I remember when I was younger, just like devouring books on like how, you know, 
companies were built and originally it started off with like science books about inventions and and all these things and then as I got a bit older it was like companies and podcasts and you know how these things were built whether that's a movement or a product and how it was marketed I don't know how I developed that interest but that's always been there um, yeah so I never really knew where that would take me but when I was looking at the roles in sales it's very you know you have to sell the product you have to understand the product you have to understand human psychology and why people are motivated to buy and then how to frame that product in a way that makes them say yes and it's very strategic um yeah. with how you're like interacting with the customer but also it's strategic to the business and um yeah I was just looking at the job descriptions I was like this sounds great and it was just a very fast paced environment as well which I absolutely loved like yeah. you know you're meeting customers face to face you're doing me like you you're you, it's client facing you're not just like stuck behind a computer all the time um and you're a very integral part of the growth of that company um so yeah it was I just followed my interests I, I right. didn't yeah I didn't know if it was a good career or not I just thought this sounds good why have I not heard of sales before because everyone was going into banking and law and finance so I'm glad I followed that yeah yeah understood and did that kind of entrepreneurship feeling that that interest can you trace it back to somebody in the family at all yes actually that's a really good question mm. that's so only recently um i realized that so my granddad my my dad has his own business but my granddad on my mum's side ha always had a business in bulgaria he passed away a while ago but i only recently learned that he's so he was alive during communist bulgaria when yes. you know bulgaria was on under communist rule mm. and i only recently learned about his whole history of his business and how it got taken away from him um you know he was an entrepreneur at heart and yes they basically forbade like forbid anyone to have any sort of business and right. to him that was like he didn't know what to do with himself so he actually you know they closed down his main business and then he started you know one that wasn't really allowed um yeah. and that's how committed he was to it because at the time you know friend his friends whole families would disappear if they did anything that was against the rules so he was yes. taking on a massive risk by starting that business um and yeah, and he just did it. <laughs> it was against the law, but he didn't know what else to do. Um, yeah. And it's crazy that I only recently discovered that about my granddad. Um, but yeah, he's definitely the entrepreneur in the family, obviously on a small scale because it's in Bulgaria. Um, it makes no I difference, though. I, I really do believe it's in the genes. I've had a number of guests and I've asked that question and they're able to then link it back to a family member somewhere down the track that has that gene of you know kind of that independence let's put it that way of doing something on your own and getting rewarded for it yeah yeah I that's literally hitting the nail on the head is it's in the genes because it's like I've always had this interest and I've always wanted to do it and there's there's like no other thing that I'd want to do it's just very <laughs> you know it's like my dream and I can't tell you where it comes from it's just me no. um, yeah so yeah brilliant okay so then the tech sales and how long were you in tech sales for I was there for just over a year um right right so yeah very high pressure environment um really interesting part of the company's growth um so yes. I joined a very fast growing company and when I joined it was great and then within a year the culture became mm. not great um and yeah there were just a lot of things that that weren't good um but I still learned a lot uh, yeah yeah and I definitely took those learnings to everything I've done since brilliant okay and then so you obviously managed to save a bit of money and then get into property but where did you get the idea from to go into property who showed you yeah. that route 
So my parents had uh, very recently started building a very small buy to let portfolio. And right. I just, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew that I needed to create some sort of income for myself to that, that wasn't a full-time job so that I could give this entrepreneurship thing a go. Yes. Um, and, you know, they just got into property. I started reading about it and I just thought, look, if I can get two or three investments um, that will just set me up with, you know, it might not be a lot of income, but enough income to live off that I can then go and do my own thing. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's how that happened. And I honestly thought that I would continue doing property. I thought when I started learning about it, I was like, this is it. I'm going to be a millionaire. Mm. I'm going to, I'm going to be a property tycoon. Um, And that's why I really immersed myself in that world with the networking, but through doing, you know, acquiring a few properties, I realized and learning about how I could grow it. I realized that actually I don't love that, but I love marketing and I love sales. So again, it was like, I had to try it. I realized it wasn't quite for me. And then I kind of went back to what I enjoy. Yeah. And then, okay. Then obviously you were doing the networking when you Mm -hmm. discovered talking to other entrepreneurs that were in the room that were saying, how do I get more customers? How do I do my marketing? And you went, hmm, there's an opportunity here. Or, you know, had you already been successful with marketing? And just, just how did that all kind of, you know, evolve? Yeah, it was very organic. So I had um, refused to use social media for a very long time. I just didn't enjoy it and I didn't want to use it. And yeah. when I was like, okay, uh, you know, I started doing research and I realized that as an entrepreneur, building a personal brand is actually quite important. And I yes. saw social media as this like necessary evil. Um, so I never used it for personal use I went straight in for business use and I just started publishing content and it wasn't even it was just sharing my thoughts about property Um, it wasn't anything specific and through networking and meeting people they found me online and I think they saw my content and they were like wow can you do this for us so it was very organic and I didn't plan it Um, no and I just, I think they just saw my social media and and were impressed. So I just got a few clients, worked with them for a bit and actually, you know, got results for them. And then it kind of grew from there. Um, right. Yeah. And you got those clients at networking events or they contact, contacted you through social media? It was a mix. So some of right. them I would meet and then they check me out online. And then as yeah. I as my audience grew and it didn't, it didn't grow by the thousands. It was just a very niche audience. Um, yes. So it was really important, like very important to have a niche because it was, it was just a network that I was building online and offline. Um, so as my audience grew, people started finding me online as well. Yes. So, yeah. Okay, great. And so helping people out and, you know, doing the, were you doing the work for them? Good question. That's been like a whole evolution. I did, yes. you know, when I started, I was very much doing the work for them. And then um, I hired some help and ultimately my, my offering pivoted to a more consultancy based offering because I realized that I wanted to set the strategy and I wanted to help the client with that but I wasn't very keen on on the whole implementation and executing. So what ended up happening is I would train my clients and then I would help them hire someone to execute on what we'd we'd kind of set together. Right. Okay. So I'm I'm intrigued. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Why did you pivot away from you? You potentially you were on the cusp of maybe even building an agency yeah um with employees uh that would do the work for clients in mm-hmm. in their social media marketing let's say and other marketing so you were on the cusp of that almost so why did you pivot 
away from that? Why did you say, mm, no, I'm not sure about this? Mm, really great question. I think if I had been more experienced, I probably could have grown that and I right. probably could have had an agency, but I was still quite inexperienced and I was coming up against a lot of problems with my clients. I wasn't setting the right boundaries. I wasn't managing them correctly. I didn't have the structure or the process. And I, I created another job for myself because I was constantly available to my clients. I just yes. didn't have, I didn't have the experience to create that offer to be something scalable. Um, so I, you know, I probably solved the problem the wrong way, but I, the way I solved that problem was like, okay, if I just um, create, you know, an online program and I'm more teaching clients, then that gets rid of the whole implementation headache. Um, and, you know, and, and that was more scalable because I could just sell, you know, sell more units or sell more um, places in the program. So yeah, it probably wasn't the best way to solve the problem, but it did work because then I started um, just launching my program and I'd have groups of business owners coming through. So yes, I, I really removed myself from the whole process as much as possible and it became a lot more effective and efficient. Great. Where did that idea come from though? So <laughs> where did you see that that was a way to you know, uninvolve yourself with clients at such a deep level and take mm. a step back, create a program, some online products perhaps as well, is it? Yeah, it was it was very much a hybrid. So I just kind of I had like I have an online portal and but I still wanted to be involved with my clients. So right. it, it was a very much a hybrid. Like they would work through the curriculum and um, yes. I would I would lead weekly sessions and we'd have all sorts of workshops and stuff. Um, but the idea came from all the online course gurus, of course. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> yes, the murky world that is yeah. online courses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So did you, you went on these online courses yourself, but I'm just, how did you discover, because I, I can imagine, how long did you do the, hands-on stuff and then do you remember yeah probably just over a year it yeah wasn't so like it, it was yeah it was during covid as well so that was really tough wow um, yeah yeah <laughs> so wow that's really tough so a year when everything's like dead almost as well and yeah you've got lots of time to invest in people um i can well imagine yeah I went through that journey as well with one client. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what you mean. And and I was, yeah, I didn't have enough boundaries myself. <laughs> so um, so when you felt, oh, this isn't feeling right, I want to do, you know, do it differently. Who, is there somebody specific online, a name, you don't have to mention the name, but is there somebody specific that you went, wow, I've just seen that on social media. I'm going to look at that. I'm going to investigate this. This could be a route for me. Mm. Yeah. So it was initially, I wasn't even part of that world. And initially it was in my property niche. Uh, they're called Inside Property Investing. Yeah. A brand that I don't know if your listeners will know, but they were very, they stood out in the property niche because they offered online courses and digital products. Um, and they eventually went off to live on a boat because they could run their whole business remotely. So I was like, okay, they're doing something right. Um, mm. So they were my initial kind of inspiration. And then I got sucked into the whole world of like Marie Folio and James Wedmore and Amy Porterfield and all the kind of online course gurus who I kind of now don't I don't really consume their content anymore no. um, yeah because it can get a bit overwhelming but but they were kind of like my you know I learned online marketing from them and and got inspired to to create an online offering from them as well right 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 and okay so it was initially the property field 
that gave you the trigger to go, there is something going on in the online world. Let me investigate this further. And then you went down the rabbit hole, learned lots about online selling or online products and courses and all of that. Okay, it makes a lot of sense. I'm just interested, you know, how we we all do it. We we go down this like crumb trail that we follow and then we go down the rabbit hole we get lost and we come out and then we have new information that we're going to try out um so tell me what was the first thing that you then did as a result of learning all of that new information what was the first perhaps product that you came up with yeah, so I think, as I said earlier, it's so easy, I think, to get overwhelmed with yes. all of this stuff online just because there's so many, you know, fake gurus and all of that and you don't really know who's, you know, who's bullshitting and who's for real. Um, so I didn't, I, I basically was like, okay, I'm going to do this as simply as possible. What I'm doing with my clients, how do I put that into an online course and I basically looked at the process I took my clients through and came because you, you end up taking this is another thing I wanted to do by the way is standardize the process that I took clients through I didn't want to another thing that was holding me back was creating custom packages for every client and again due to inexperience I would say yes to everything and that ended up meaning that I was making less money. I was spending ages serving clients because I was doing all these tweaks that they wanted, yes. even though I I knew myself that actually I'm, I have the same or a similar strategy for every client because I know what works. Yes. Um, so, so I just, I had my framework and I was like, this is what I take clients through. Anyone that wants to work with me, they're going to go through this process and with my calls I can customize it to them or if they have problems or issues applying my framework because this is a thing people think that their like case is you very unique and that their business is unique and their problems are unique but actually you just need a framework and yes you can customize it but at the end of the day there's a few ways that you can solve a problem um yes. yeah so that's so I I just I looked at my my process and then I just um filmed video lessons for each part of it and I right. put it all on a, on an online portal it was free at the time it was member vault I, I created the whole thing for free um and then any new clients that joined instead of me basically teaching them on our calls I would give them the logins they would watch all of the lessons they would do the worksheets and then when we had our calls it would be very much like coaching them and troubleshooting and it was a lot more productive then because I wasn't sitting there talking at them for like hours yes, yes. Um, so yeah and 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 it was a very effective thing as well like my client results skyrocketed um it was a really good choice uh I just think if you're looking to do that and you want to make it more passive, then you do need to have a large audience because you need to sell a lot <laughs> to make money, right? Because if you're offering a more customized solution, then you're going to be able to charge more. So yeah, it's a lot of things I've, to consider. I would like to do a high five. <laughs> yeah. and, and a congratulations, congrats emoji, or like whatever that emoji is. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. I, you know, well done, Ina. That's thank you for sharing because I think I've been on about kind of online teaching and learning for many, many years. I'm not saying I've done brilliantly out of it, but I've done okay ish in places. And I do believe it is the way of the world, especially since covid mm -hmm. i think it's just skyrocketed and i i do something in my personal time which is uh japanese taiko drumming and i helped through covid my taiko drumming teacher to go online wow. and we're now putting together over the next six months well he already has content online but now we're going to create a global course to sell online around the world for taiko drumming 
and it 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 is the way I talked to I mentioned it to him in when I first started in December 2018 and mm -hmm. he hadn't even heard about anything online so yeah. we're finally going to do it you know like a long time afterwards so That's well so done exciting. You... <laughs> yeah it is it is exciting hugely exciting and yeah I think you've done brilliantly at such a young age to be getting involved in this world it will only grow now I've got a tip thing to share with you that I only discovered literally mm -hmm. last week and that is I had never heard of it you probably have because you've done a lot of research and that is not just for you but all the listeners and that is 1000 true fans have you heard of this yes yes yeah. great so what's your understanding then I'm going to hand it over to you <laughs> oh gosh you're testing my knowledge now is it is it pat flynn that came up with that concept i don't know who came up with it i, I saw it in a in an article on i think it was substack or medium or anyway it's it's somewhere yeah. if you if you don't want to share it i can no no really... I, I will share it but you can Go let on. me know if it's right because yeah yeah let's let's debate it even yeah. yeah so my understanding I think what they were trying to put across is you only need 1000 true fans to make you know I think it's like 100k a year or something um yes. you don't need a huge audience or that many people in your audience to to make money basically you just need a select few people that buy into you you and your story is that right yeah so yeah. Basic, yeah, spot on. And just to add to that, those people, those thousand true fans will buy everything that you do, right? Yeah, that, that and they the only need point. to spend £100 a year, which is why the 100 k But if you want to make more, you know, if you want to make 200 k then you get them to spend £200 a year or you need to get 2,000 fans. Mm -hmm. a year true fans which is probably harder to get so the reason i'm bringing it up because i picked up on what the language you used about having a niche and that then came into my head it's the niche is actually the amount of fans that you have that will always continue to support you on mm -hmm. your journey of online stuff and they're interested always in supporting you but it also means you have to do everything for them. Mm -hmm. You have to ask for their views. You have to engage them. You have to get feedback from them. You have to reward them. You have to literally treat them as part of the family, mm -hmm. you know, and grow your business and grow their business together. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a wonderful, simple concept. And if we just focused on that, we'd all have really successful businesses i think um what do you reckon yeah no i agree i just think it's um it's a simple concept but i know always this is like my motto if i had one motto it's like simple doesn't equal easy and it's like the simplest concepts you know people think oh it's simple it means it's easy it's you know it might be straightforward but actually the implementation you know, you need to be consistent. I think that's the main thing with building any type of community or audience is you need to be so consistent. Um, and it's just not easy because there's going to be ups and downs in your journey, but you're always visible. And, and if you really want to create value for your community, you probably should share the downs and that can be quite hard. So it's by no means an easy thing to do. But if you can do it, then, yeah, you, you'd have a business and, and a great business at that. Brilliant. I, I love your perspective on it. And I love your mantra, which is simple doesn't equal easy. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. OK, so you've got products now, I take it, that people can purchase. Do you want to share a little bit about them and what they do for people? Yeah, of course. So I don't actually have any really passive products or anything like that. I still work with people very closely. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I help them to attract more customers. So if you're either new online or 
you're an established business, but you're looking to move online um, and you're looking to, you know, get known and build your yes. brand and, and sign your first or next client. That's what I can help with. Um, but the goal for me really is to, to grow my audience from here on out um, and to just get more people into my ecosystem. So that's where social media comes in, um, which we had a little chat about before isn't the easiest thing to do as a business owner. Um, but yeah, so if you did want to find me, I'm on social media. So Instagram, YouTube and TikTok. Right, right. So let's <laughs> let, let's unpack just a few little things. Mm. If people wanted to get on your what you call it? Uh, it's called a content. Yeah. Content accelerator. That's my program. Content accelerator. OK, brilliant. So the content accelerator, what would happen if people signed up for that? Yeah, so as I said, it's it's very personalized. So it depends on where you are in your business, but it would it would help you to completely transform your online marketing. Um, yeah. And really, we start from the basics, which is really nailing your offer, because that's really the key. Um, you don't need all the fancy funnels and all the fancy tech. If you're just starting out, you need a rock solid offer um, yes. because, because that's going to apply to all of your content, all of your messaging, everything you do. Um, so we really nail that. And actually a lot of people, even if they have more established businesses, can benefit from really honing in on that. Yes. Uh, and then over the course of either 12 weeks or six months, um, depending on where you are, we really transform your content and we get you to a place where you can confidently create content for your business that sells your services. Um, and at the same time, we look at signing a client together, whether that's your first client or your next client um, that we found online. So that's really the outcome of my program. I want you to have a method for signing clients um, from social media online that you can use again and again in your business and did sorry did you just say how long a tech how long do you think uh, this is like how long is a piece of string question but <laughs> um typically how long do you think that journey takes with people um so it, it can take 12 weeks so three months or up to six months okay. um it yeah, it depends on how like big the clients you're signing are. So if yes. if your if your service is fairly low ticket, then usually it happens a lot faster. But you know, yeah. if you've got if you're selling high ticket consulting packages or high ticket services, then it can take a little bit longer. Yeah, absolutely. And do you, what kind of clients are you looking to attract, Ina? Um, really uh, anyone that's offering services so whatever industry you're in whether that's you're offering education you're offering consulting or you are a freelancer if you're looking to attract a service client um, so not a product I don't help people sell products but anyone that's looking to sell more of their services I can yeah. help yeah brilliant that sounds very cool and what what What's the future looking like? Have you got a bit of a vision of where you think this might be going for you? Um, honestly, I'm not quite sure. Right now, I'm really focused on, you know, working with my clients, but also mm. um, growing the audience. And I'm really looking for a way to to do that sustainably. Um, I, I, you know, I used to get all of my business from Instagram. Um, but I don't, I'm not as active on there anymore, just because I'm finding that it's, it's not good for me, <laughs> to be honest. Um, it's a lot of, you have to be present every day. And I think that's really great if you're just starting out to get your first, to build your community, to get your clients. It's, yeah. it's incredible. Um, but just where I am now, I need to find a more sustainable and scalable way of growing my audience. And that is YouTube. Um, but YouTube is is hard. Um, so I'm still figuring out how to create the amount of content for YouTube that I need to create to grow my yes. audience. Yeah. Great. I mean, we, we had a brief chat before we um, pressed the record button about 
my personal love hate relationship with they're now called Meta Facebook. <laughs> um, I just I'm not on WhatsApp. I prefer to not be on Facebook, but from a business point of view, if you want to be discovered, you've got to have a bit of presence. It helps SEO. I came off Instagram when it all exploded around Facebook and the scandals and the data mm -hmm. selling and all of that came out when I felt that Mark Zuckerberg was lying through his teeth that he wasn't selling our data, which he completely is. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I did come back on because I wanted to promote the podcast. So I'm only on Instagram to promote the podcast. I only have a Facebook business page to promote the podcast and I rarely post on my personal page mm -hmm. uh, and I help my Tycho teacher promote the courses for his business. Um, so what, so it's interesting you said that comment about Instagram mm. because I would have, I would have put you in the bracket of an Instagram person, you know, you're the right kind of age profile demographic so what, what happened on Instagram that made you turn off a little bit? Mm, I mean, I think it's universal across the board. Creators are leaving Instagram just because it's, it, it's, not, it's not good for creators. It's difficult. They've made it mm. really, really difficult for, for businesses and people using it. Like it goes down to the very basic level of when TikTok um, came out. <laughs> Creating content in TikTok is, I won't say easy, but it's, you know, it is quite easy. Like, obviously it takes time, but creating a short video, you can realistically do it quickly. And so as a business owner, you can maintain that, yeah. that content production quite easily. Instagram trying to compete with TikTok and the real, like the Reels feature, the Reels feature is so difficult and so buggy to use. And right. It's just on a very basic level. I was spending hours creating content on Instagram and I just thought like this isn't the amount of time I'm putting in now isn't yes. worth it. You right. know, before it was, but now it wasn't. And I know that I can focus on other things that are going to give me a better ROI. Um, but as I say, things like stories, absolutely incredible. Like if you're just starting out, you can you know you can sign your first client on there very easily you can build a community just by doing stories um yes. i still think that's an incredible tool but in terms of like growing your audience on instagram i think it's really tough and i'm finding that a lot of creators are actually leaving i've seen wow. yeah i've seen a lot of people that you know when i started we we were doing the same thing and i can see that they've either moved to tiktok or just looked at other ways um, mm. of growing their business. Fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. I had no idea. You tell you what, one little thing that happens every time I post, uh, I do this little tiny audio clip, which I'll do for you as well. I'll put it on Instagram, which will be a clip from our interview with a little bit of a comment from me about it. Literally mm -hmm. two minutes. And I put this as a little, through an app, create a little audio clip to get people interested to go and listen to the full episode. Every time I post that, because I use the hashtag podcast, as mm -hmm. you would, I get four, five, if not six people going, promote it here, promote it here, you know. And I keep, you know, reporting it, blocking it, spam, da 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 but it just keeps happening over and over. And it's, I'm going, oh, guys, this is rubbish. How have you allowed people to get notifications that quick that if somebody's put in hashtag podcast, they get an instant and an automated posted here on mm. your post? How's even anybody been able to hack that? Because it must have been hacked with an app or something do you know what I mean yeah it's just not a very good user experience <laughs> no is it? awful yeah it's like get away I'm never going to personally do anything on here I'm just doing it for the podcast to help my guests get seen that's it yeah. that's it you know <laughs> but I know that if I go in literally 
15 minutes later, all these all these uh, posts are there on the episode and I'm going, mm. and I'm thinking, oh, my guests must think I'm allowing it, but I'm not, <laughs> you know, it's just Instagram is rubbish. Yeah. So I have a, I have a question for you. Have you discovered, are you doing anything on social audio yet? No, I'm not. What is that a new app? <laughs> I've not heard no. of it. No, you know, you've heard about Clubhouse, I'm sure. Yes, I have thoughts on Clubhouse. <laughs> Go on, share us your thoughts. <laughs> Do you like Clubhouse though? Because I don't want to offend you. <clears throat> well, I tell you what, a really quick story about my Clubhouse journey. I was late yeah. to the party. I hadn't heard of it. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I saw this media coming out about it. So I checked it out. Couldn't go on there without an invite. So I created an account. I was on the waiting list. Literally two days later, somebody who has since been on my podcast, who I kind of vaguely knew from LinkedIn, Twitter, never talked to, invited me to come on Clubhouse. So I joined. I started listening to rooms. There was one particular person who said, oh, this is amazing. Let's do a room together. And oh, OK, yeah. Bad storytelling. That's my my gig. Storytelling through different means podcast one of them and we hosted this room together and we got all these people talking and this one person came on who was driving in a car uh, in America and shared us her whole partner's life story and I wasn't the key host and I was like get this person off <laughs> we don't want to hear about Honestly, it was really sad because she had a load of abusive partners and my heart went out to her. And nobody had the courage to kind of go, listen, that's it's not great, this story, but we really can't help you. It was like a therapy session. And since then, I haven't hosted another room. And this is like over 12 months ago. But I'm I kind of creeped back in and listened to some rooms there were some business ones how to become you know millionaire I don't know was a millionaire breakfast club or whatever and I, I I listen to it and I go and I literally sit there with my hands in my head my head in my hands and I'm going oh my god these people are I have a new a new term now Ina and it's called go on. not ego but migo with an M, yeah. my ego, Migo. Mm -hmm. They're just Migo, Migo maniacs, basically. Mm -hmm. It's all about me, 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 me. And then the the again, if you're on Clubhouse and you have a massive profile, I apologize. The comment, the profiles that go the 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 emojis and the text on it. I'm going. Who are you trying to prove what to? So, yeah, I've been put off by Clubhouse too. There is mm -hmm. one room I really love, and it's called the Gratitude Activator with Rex Sykes, who has also been a guest. And it's all about how to live your life in a positive way and some really amazing tips and techniques how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I jump in there now and again. I contribute a little bit. I I know a few things about that that I, you know, do myself. Tell me your thing about Clubhouse then. <laughs> no, that was an interesting insight just because I never even, I never even got that far. I never even used it that much. Um, so, but that's very much what I imagined <laughs> the Clubhouse experience to be like. Um, my the thoughts on it were just, it's so time consuming, again, as a creator um, and when it came out everyone was hyping it up and going crazy but I just thought it was in lockdown I think it came out and I yes. just thought this is going to change when we're out of lockdown and secondly it's not a very you're not creating evergreen content so as a creator you have to invest so much time in talking and then it's not I mean I guess you could record it but a lot of the time yes. it's very you know you have to be there <laughs> To, to build an audience um, and I just thought it just wasn't very time efficient 
Um, and then the few conversations and comments that I did hear were that people would just, as you say, go on and on and on. And it's really just not very efficient um, and a bit of a, as you say, stroking egos and that kind of thing. So that, those are my thoughts on it. Great. <laughs> That's brilliant. So now um, LinkedIn um, have now come out with LinkedIn Audio. Right. Right. And I've just started. Today will be my third event that I'm doing mm -hmm. on there. It's a totally different audience and a totally different subject matter. Right. Okay. I'm just dipping my toe in at the moment and seeing how it goes. Uh, I'm meeting some interesting people. We're just talking about social audio as a topic. Mm -hmm. So I'm not talking about my my business. I'm not promoting myself. I'm just I would like to grow people's knowledge about social audio and how they could use it. Wow. But at the same time, get insights in terms of their experience as well. And I'm only because I agree time is it, it is a time absorber. I'm only doing it for 45 minutes. That allows me a 15 minute overrun. So I know mm -hmm. I can do it within the hour, but I'm really tight on the timing. I don't want it to be two hours. I don't want it to run for three hours, which a lot of rooms do. You know, it's ridiculous. People got not anything else to do. You know? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh. um, so it depends where your audience is, though, because I can well imagine if you're looking for small business owners or large business owners, they will be on LinkedIn mm. now because LinkedIn wasn't in existence. I used to train people in LinkedIn. I created a massive video course on LinkedIn that's still on Udemy. And a lot, it's a lot out of date now because the platform has moved on. However, LinkedIn is starting to get more traction again. Yeah. Um, and I do believe LinkedIn Audio has something about it. Anyway, that's, that's really my view cool. on it. That's cool. I might join one of your rooms. Um, do. Yeah. I haven't, we need to be, I haven't we used need the to be, feature yet. So. No, no, you should be able, it's now gone, come out of beta. So even if you haven't got creator mode switched on, I just checked with my wife last night. She doesn't have creator mode switched on because that was the, the, the thing you had to have switched on. Um, she didn't, she doesn't have a switch on, but she can do events with LinkedIn audio now. So I think okay. everybody has it probably. Um, but yeah, if you're, if you see my event, it's two o'clock this afternoon. It will only be my third one. Somebody else is hosting it with me because I've, I've realized you can't do it on your own. You need to have somebody there because if no one comes on the stage, then you're just talking to yourself and that's <laughs> rubbish. Yeah. So I'm still oh, learning, cool. Ina, but <laughs> I think personally, the feeling I'm getting about social audio right now it's about it's a little bit like the early days of social media. Mm. Interesting. I think it's yeah, space to watch for sure. Ina, please share with us. I'll put it in the show notes. Where can people find you? How can they connect with you? Yeah, of course. So if you want to just learn from me, then YouTube's probably the best place. If you just type in Ina Bakalova, I'm pretty sure there's no other Ina Bakalova on there yet. Um, or similarly on Instagram, if you want to DM me again, it's Ina Bakalova. Uh, and then if you just want funny content, then TikTok again, Ina Bakalova. Brilliant. And of course, you're on LinkedIn as well. Yes, I am. I should probably use that more. So I'm also on there. Definitely, the because there's an invitation from me to connect pending at the moment. Ah, that would be because I've probably got 200 connections pending yes. that I haven't. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no problem. Don't accept all of them. Some of them could definitely be time wasters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Ina, it's been lovely chatting with you. Uh, sounds like you're doing great. I wish you so much success. Do keep in touch. Uh, let me know how it's all going. Um, it's been wonderful chatting with you. Thank you so much. 
No, no worries. Hopefully your listeners have got some insights from this and just thank you for being such an incredible interviewer. I can see where the storytelling aspect comes in for sure. So thank you. Take care. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests. So do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.